All right, we're there in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to come back to this later in the sermon. <clears throat> and right now, I'm actually going to go to, uh, you don't have to turn there, you stay in 1 Corinthians 11 for now if you want, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The title of this message is Transgender Christian. Transgender Christian. You might think, well, what is that? Oh, sorry. Let's get the record going. How about that? We're going to put it on pause. All right, we're good. <laughs> transgender Christian. You might, what is that? What's transgender Christian? Well, we know what transgender is these days. You know, the world's got all kinds of crazy ideas, right? We can observe in our society, you know, it getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And you got people today that say, well, I'm a, I'm a man, but I'm, I'm a woman on the inside. I'm, I'm a woman born in a man's body. Or I'm a woman born in a man's body. And then they'll try to, like, go back to what they think they should have been born as, and they call that being transgender, right? And now hopefully everybody in here knows that that's crazy. And people like that belong in a nut house, yea, rather to be stoned, is what I think. But there are Christians, though, that still cross the same lines that these people are crossing. You might wonder, what in the world? What Christian would be transgender? Or, well, we're going to look. And we, we read 1 Corinthians 11, and you, maybe you've noticed a little bit in that, the very first part of that chapter, talking about how God wants there to be something done for men and something different done for women about hair. And we're going to come back to that. But first of all, I'd like to point out just in Genesis chapter 1, how many genders are there? Because he says, God created man in his image, and it says, male and female created he them. That's where the list stops, by the way. Amen. It's male, female. You know, these days, you know, I guess on Facebook or whatever, you can put your gender, you know, you got like whatever, hundreds of options of genders. It's like, no, it's just two of them. Okay, and you don't get to pick. Because notice it doesn't say... Adam decided that he was a man. No, it said God created man to be man, and then he created woman. God is the one that determines gender. He's the one that decides who's a man, who's a woman. That's why we'll, t we'll have gender reveal parties. We're going to have a gender reveal party for my next baby. And the baby didn't tell us, you know, what it, what it is. <laughs> you know, the doctor, and that's the hypocrisy. The doctor is going to tell you what it is you know, through science, through, you know, the chromosomes, right? So anyways, you know, you know, and some of the stuff I want to be talking about, you know, hopefully we've all heard this, but, you know, maybe some of this stuff we maybe haven't heard. And, you know, this sermon isn't geared to, you know, attack someone who's guilty of any of this stuff or has been guilty. You know, this, this, the point of it is so that we can figure out maybe what we're doing wrong or, or, or just to be educated on this so that we can fix it, Right. Because we're going to be talking about things that are going to step on a lot of toes, at least in the world's eyes. Maybe not as much here, right? And then go ahead and you turn to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians later in the sermon. So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Because see, God cares about what we look like. He cares about our appearance. Okay? In Matthew chapter 23, in verse 25, we're going to look at what it says here. Jesus is speaking to the scribes. He's preaching against the scribes. In Matthew 23, verse 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So you, you know what? It is more important for the inside and the heart to be right with God. That is more important than what the outside appearance looks like. And some people say, well, there you go. See, it doesn't even matter. See, they look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're horrible. They got it all wrong. They need to just worry about the inside. It doesn't matter the outside. Well, let's read on. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So, yes, it's more important to have the inside of the cup and the platter clean. That, that matters most. That's priority number one. But is that just where we should stop? Is that the end? No, it, that, the outside may be clean also. We want to have the inside and the outside be right. Because God cares about both, right? 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye, out, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisies and iniquity. So yeah, we need to be righteous in our heart and appear righteous. We don't want to just appear righteous. And, you know, if you're going to have to pick and choose, start with the heart. The heart of the matter just, you know, is just reflected by the outside of the appearance, right? There's that old saying, you know, you shouldn't judge a book by its character, you know, or, or a, a, a book by its cover, rather. Right. But that's the purpose of the cover. Right. <laughs> the, the, you don't read a book and then decide if you want to read the book. Yeah. Right. You look at the cover and say, okay, this is the title, this suits, but here's the synopsis, you know, here's the table of contents, and then you decide what you, if you're going to read it or not. That's, right. that's what the whole purpose of it is. You know, can you imagine going into a library where there are no covers and it's just text? You, you just got to read it all if you want to know. You can't judge a book by its cover. Well, that's, that's, that's going to take a long time to figure out what you want to read then, right? Like, I, there's no subjects, no, fiction or nonfiction. You just got to read it to figure it out. The whole point of the outside is so that you know what's going on, on the inside. These two are related. And so I want to point out here that we, we don't want to just look righteous. We want to be righteous if we can. You know, we're all sinners, right? But we're, we're supposed to be trying cleanse ourselves through God's Word. You get saved first, but you know that's not what the subject is. So the outside does matter. We, need to, we, we should appear righteous. We need to be right. When God looks down on us, we need to be looking right. right? And, and God cares about what we look like. So some people say, well, God, God doesn't care what the outside looks like. You know, God, He sees my heart. Right? God looketh on the heart. You know, God doesn't look like man, how man looks on us. God just looks on our heart, and that's all He cares about. You know, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, uh, you go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 3, if you'd like. Genesis chapter 3 is where you're turning. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is when David is going to be anointed king, and Samuel's going to do so, but he doesn't know who it's going to be. It says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look, uh, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. This is one of the brothers of David that God had refused to be king. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, there you go. So the outward appearance doesn't matter. Well, is that what the verse says? This verse is just saying, hey, God can see the heart. Man can't see the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance. But yes, yeah, so man looketh on the outward appearance. So man doesn't see your heart. So how much more is it important to look right and, and so that you're not a stumbling block to your fellow man, right? And yet, God does know your heart. God knows our wicked hearts. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God can. So yeah, the heart is being reflected by the outside. And man looketh on the outside. But that doesn't somehow mean that the outside doesn't matter. We need to get both right. In this sermon, I'm going to focus on the outside appearance, but I don't want you to just think that I'm saying that the inside doesn't matter because that's actually more important. So don't you know, lose the priority. Okay. So, <clears throat> and you're in Genesis chapter 3 because does God care about our appearance is what we're, we're, we're talking about, what we're going to be looking at, and how it regards to things that are specific to our gender. Because the title of the sermon is A Transgender Christian. How are Christians today crossing their gender and becoming like another gender? How are men, Christian men, becoming like women or women you know, that are Christians becoming like men today? Well, you know, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, And the eyes of both of them were opened. And this is talking about when Adam and Eve first sinned, they knew that they had sinned. And both their eyes were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Skip down to verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So in this door we see, okay, man knows that he's sinned. So he's, oh man, I'm naked. I need to put, a, I need to put something on, cover this up. And then later God's like, no, you're doing it wrong. Let me dress you because I want you to be dressed a certain way. You can't just dress however. I'm going to dress you the way I want you to be dressed. That's, what, that's basically what's going on. And yeah, there's symbolic you know, things, you know, the plants for, you know, symbolizing our works, and then the animal sacrifice representing the blood of Jesus and His skins that cover our nakedness and our shame. 
But yet, God actually did. You don't want to. You don't want to lose what he literally did over the symbolism. He literally wanted them to be dressed the way that he wanted them to be dressed. So he right there shows you in the very beginning, Genesis chapter three, right when man sinned. All right, let me show you how to get dressed right away. So maybe maybe God cares how we dress, right? Don't be wearing plants. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so turn to Deuteronomy chapter twenty-two, verse five. Now. Hopefully in this church we know this verse. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. It's one of my favorite verses. I think it's a good verse to memorize, especially in today's queer society, right? So this verse is the only verse in the whole Bible that you can point to to have this standard of gender-specific clothing, okay? Because hopefully we can look at the freaks out there and say, okay, these guys are disgusting. They're a dude dressed up in drag and it's just, you know... Hopefully we can look at this and think, uh, there's something wrong with that. Right. Hopefully, you know, our gut and our instincts tell us this isn't right. Or if a woman dressed up like a dyke or something, hopefully we can look at that and say, there's, there's something wrong with that. Right. Right? right? But if we're just having that opinion of our own accord, well, who cares? Because what is our opinion really at the end of the day if God doesn't have the same view? If God doesn't have that opinion, who are we to say what's right and wrong? Right? And just about everybody in here would probably say, yeah, there should, being transgender or a transvestite, it, there's a problem with that. You shouldn't be that. Yeah, right. Well, do you want God to, to back you up on that? Because if you do, this is the only verse you have. Or else you're just making up your own standards. You just have your own opinion. And, I, you know, let's, let's see what it says. Let's see what this verse says about men and women's clothing here. Because this is what the verse is about. It says in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God, period. Now, you can read the whole chapter of this if you want. The verses before don't have anything to do with this verse and the verses after. He's listing off different laws and commands that he wants his people to do. So, you can read the context. This is not taken out of context. This is... Can stand alone by itself and what does it say he says that the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a woman well what is he talking about what, what is he getting at well keep reading and he says neither shall a man put on a woman's garment so in the same way that a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man neither shall a man put on a woman's garment okay so we're talking about a garment so what's a garment it's clothing Garment just means clothing. Probably everybody knows that already. So this verse is saying there, there is an article of clothing for men that pertains to men that women should never wear. And then there's a garment of there's an article of clothing for women that men should never wear. And whenever you start crossing the line and you're you're a man putting on a woman's garment or a woman putting a man's garment on, you are an abomination. Is what it says. It doesn't say that what you're doing is an abomination. It says you are an abomination. Look at, look at what it says. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. That's some pretty strong language. I mean, I don't want to be an abomination. What is an abomination? An abomination is something that is hated or despised or God looks at it and he's disgusted with it. These are the things that go hand in hand with something that's an abomination. You know what? And we probably feel the same way. If we look at someone who's this transvestite, we're probably going to say, yeah, that's an abomination. That's disgusting. You know, I don't like that. I hate that. Right? I mean, that's a normal reaction, I think. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you know, so, well, what is, the, what, what is the clothing, though? Okay, and some people say, well, this is the Old Testament. This doesn't apply. So, you know, what you're saying doesn't matter. Okay, well, are you throwing out the authority to have a standard in this area, then? You're throwing out, if you throw out this verse, if you say, oh, this is Old Testament, so this doesn't apply to us. Well, now, what, there's nothing keeping us from having a man dress up like a woman in full drag. Yep. There's nothing wrong with it, according to that. Well, this is the Old Testament. Right. No, how about this is for us? Right. This is for us now. Because, you know, nothing in the New Testament says that this is no longer applied. Oh, that whole thing about cross-dressing, that was symbolic or, uh, or whatever. Because those are the things that have been done away with. Yeah. The things that have symbolic reasons, right. you know... This is right and wrong, is what this is. <laughs> you know, 
You know, and if it's symbolic, what does it symbolize? You know, like Brother John was saying this morning, what does it symbolize? So now we can figure out, okay, well, now we need to figure out what's, what's for women that men should never wear and vice versa. Well, you go through all the different clothing options. You use the process of elimination, right? And see, and I don't think this, this, this is not talking about underwear. Because so what's the point of this? Because if he's talking about something you don't see because it's underwear, then is that really what he's trying to accomplish? What is he trying to accomplish? He wants there to be an outward difference of the appearance of what a man looks like and what a woman looks like. If, I mean, so it has to be some type of outer wear, something that everyone can see, right? So what's the garment? Well, let's start with, let's start with men. What, what should a man never wear, but it's okay for a woman to wear? You know, is it shoes? What would you say? Dress. It's a dress. There you go. I mean, does everybody agree with that? Amen. If you don't, then get out. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, for, it's a dress, right? You can go through shirt, you know, you know, you know, whatever, right? Socks. Is it a tie? Only men should wear, you know. It's dress, okay? It's not okay for a, for a man to wear a dress. Amen. That just blew your mind right there, right? That's a revelation. Well, you know, you got to tell people this. Because you know what? On the 4th of July, I went to a parade. And you know what I saw in the parade? Open, everyone's okay with it. A bunch of dudes wearing a dress playing the bagpipes. Cross-dressing. What does the Bible say? They are an abomination. I don't care what they think they're doing. Or what they call it. Oh, no, it's, that's not a dress. That's a kilt. Okay, well, I mean, it's a dress. I don't care if it's flannel. Okay? You know, don't learn bagpipes if you don't want to wear it. Uh, I mean, I w if I played bagpipes, I wouldn't wear a dress. I'm just saying. I'd be the only guy in that parade without, without a skirt on. Okay, well, what? Let's, let's turn that around. Because, you know, most people with a brand in their head will, will be able to tell you, okay, yeah, dudes shouldn't wear dresses. Amen. You know, whether it's a kilt or a tunic or a, just a robe, you know, that is, this is a dress. Okay, that's not okay. Okay, what about for the woman? What about on this side of the equation? Well, what's something that's, that's okay for a man to wear, but women should never wear? Now, if you ask this question to the world, they'll say, well, nothing. Just all, everything goes. You know, well, then this verse would make no sense. Yep. Okay. Well, this, I think this verse is actually talking about something that exists. I think it's talking about something that reals. I think there's something that pertains to a man that's a garment that a woman should not wear. And I think it's pants. Okay, because if, you're, if, you're, if you can not wear, you know, a dress as a man... Well, what are you going to be wearing if you can't wear a dress as a man? Right. Probably pants, right? Or, 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 or shorts or something, right? Okay, well, there you go. That's what interchange. You know, look at the bathroom sign. We don't have a bathroom sign, but go to, you know, somewhere, you know, go to Starbucks, right? And they're going to have a bathroom sign. And you know what the sign is? The universal sign for male and female? It's not hair length. It's not color. It's all black and white. And it's a dude wearing pants and a woman wearing a dress. Amen. Even the world's going to tell you that. But then they're going to turn around and say, oh, well, that's not gender specific. Well, why are you making a bathroom sign that's saying that it is? You know what I mean? So, anyways. Um, oh, yeah, I heard one time, somebody brought up the argument one time. Well, when it says that which pertains unto a, a man, that's not talking about a garment. That's talking about armor. Because back then, men wore armor because they were soldiers. And the women are not supposed to wear that. Okay, well, the problem with that is, is where does it say that? Where does it say armor? Oh, my, my, you know, my, my Bible, you know, study Bible told me that. Well, that's not God's word. <laughs> so I don't care what your study Bible says. You know, because it's all one sentence here. And he's using it interchangeably with the next statement of it being a garment. In the same way that a woman's not going to wear that which pertains to a, a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. It's, it's pretty obvious. Okay, and what is, it, what is the proof, or why do I think it's breaches besides common sense? Because it's like, well, this is just one verse. Do we really need a bunch of verses explaining to us something that should be common sense? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, God doesn't have to go on and on about it, because why should He have to? Okay, yeah, he puts a verse in there because of all the freaks and weirdos that want to challenge this basic concept. But sh do we really need that? I think one verse is enough. I think this is pretty clear. 
Okay, well, I'm going to read from Exodus 28, verse 42 here. And this is when God is telling the priests what to wear. And it says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. So here's an example. Well, I'll continue reading to get the context. And they shall be upon Aaron, which is a dude. That's a man, not a woman. And upon his sons, also male. When they come unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die, it shall be a statue forever unto him and his seed after him. So, you know, it's funny. If, if Aaron or his sons, when they're ministering in the priest's office, if they were to come in in a linen dress, if they're not wearing what he just said, he just said, lest they die. So if some cross-dressing preacher wants to come in into the, the tabernacle, God's going to kill them. Now get out of here, you transvestite, and they're gonna, you're going to you're gonna hear the bells ring on that one. You know, because they would wear the bells, right? Just so if, if they died, you could hear, oh, well, they're dead. Pull them out, right? <laughs> so God's basically going to kill these dudes if they don't wear what he's telling them to wear. You know, I think this is, this is just this is a good example to see men wearing pants. Because, see, some people say, well, our pants weren't even invented until, you know, 400 years ago, or, or whatever they'll say, or, or, or 1,000 years ago. And this is... You know, roughly 4,000 years ago in Moses' day. Okay, pants were an event. Well, here's an example of pants being mentioned for men, and it's specific for men, okay? And the, the spelling's different because, in, you know, we might think of this saying, you know, you're too big for your britches, B-R-I-T-C-H-E-S. And this is breeches, so it's two E's instead. Well, that just means trousers, hosing, or pants. Right. And, you know, another example, you know, in the Bible of men wearing pants, beside these mentions, the breeches is, is brought up, I think, five times. And then I think the sixth time is with Daniel and hit and, or not Daniel, but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the book of Daniel when they were tied up with all their different garments. And a part of that was their hosen, which is just a word that just means pants. Not n never a time will you find a woman wearing hosen you know, or pants in the Bible. So. I think that is pretty obvious of what, it's, what it is. You know, if it's not talking about pants and dresses, then what is it talking about? You know, you can just think about this on your own, be honest with yourself, and you, you got just a, a few choices. Either the verse applies or it doesn't apply. It's, you know, or it's talking about something that doesn't exist, right? And if it existed then and it doesn't exist now, that's the same thing as saying that it doesn't apply anymore. Or you have to figure out what the garments are. What is the garment? I mean, you know, and you can figure it out on your own if you don't, if you don't agree with me. Okay. Well, what about material? What, maybe it could be like the type of material that you're wearing. Maybe if, if you're a dude and you're wearing a dress that's made out of leather, maybe that's okay. That's manly, right? Who wants to wear that, men? I don't want to wear that. Because, see, they'll, they'll apply that to the women. Well, th those are not men's pants. They're women's pants. Okay, well, what does it mean to even be women's pants? Well, they're tight. Well, that sounds real godly. That sounds like what we should be trying to accomplish. What's that going? What does it mean when you're wearing something tight like that? What's the point of wearing clothes? Okay, Adam and Eve, they were, they were naked, so they wore the clothes, right? God told the priest, hey, you're going to put these britches on. They're going to cover your nakedness, okay? Well, if you're wearing something that's skin tight, are you really accomplishing the goal of covering your nakedness all that well? No. No. <laughs> I mean, don't get so brainwashed by all the superhero garbage that you just think that you've got to go around in spandex all the time or whatever. You're, you're, you're missing the point. Okay, well, I don't know the exact complex, you know, complexion of their skin or where, or where or what freckles they have, so therefore they're sufficiently covering their nakedness. No, I don't, I don't think so. You know, and, I, and normally you wouldn't be okay with that. You wouldn't be comfortable with that, but because you're just surrounded by that and you're just brainwashed to think that that's okay, that's acceptable, that's why you're comfortable. Because the initial response is to uh, yeah, put something over that. You know. But let's say, you know, you got purple pants. You got baggy pink pants. They, you, know, you know, you got you know, glitter pants. So that's, that's what women can wear. Well, I don't think anyone should wear that, to be honest with you. <laughs> or, you know, well, apply it the other way. Does it make sense the other way? You got a, a dude wearing, you know, denim, a denim dress. Is that okay? I don't think so. What if Pastor Burgess comes in here and he's wearing a denim skirt? Is that okay? Hey, good morning. 
I'm going to a different church. You know, I'm, it, it's, hypo, it's a hypocritical standard to say, well, you can't do it for men. But it's okay to do it with women, though. Okay, well, why is it okay? Well, because everyone else is doing it. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That, that sounds like a good argument. Well, you know, my grandma's doing it, or all these older people are doing it, and yeah, all the actors and actresses are doing it. I mean, that doesn't hold water. Okay? And, you know, there is coming a time in this country where you are going to see just men all the time wearing dresses and skirts. They'll have manly material. <laughs> That's coming. I mean, that, it, I'm glad that we can preach this now and hopefully, like, get our bearings a little bit on what's male, what's female, while we still have a chance because the world's just trying to run with the craziness and just make everything completely backwards. You know, the Lord calls male and female, you know, bittersweet, you know, and God, the, the devil wants to call that which is sweet, bitter, and bittersweet, and male, female, that's, you know, he wants to just twist it all up. You know, God is not the author of confusion. What do you think the devil's trying to do? The devil's trying to blur the lines. God divides the light from the darkness. The devil wants a whole bunch of gray, right? You know, there, there was a pastor that I went that, at a church that I was going to one time. I won't say his name. <laughs> but, uh, so he, he, was, he was going through this series on why we need to have high standards, and in, in, uh, specifically standards in the church. Okay, I guess he saw something going on that he didn't approve of. So he's preaching through why we need to have high standards. And he, and he wanted to preach and teach that, hey, men need to be wearing pants and women need to be wearing dresses at church. At church. Don't get crazy. You don't go freak out on me. Just at church is what he was teaching them. And he was saying, he turned to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. It says, see, he'll, he said, some people think that this verse is teaching that, you know, women should not wear pants. But that's not what it teaches, though. That's not what it, you know, and I don't remember what Bocus explanation he had, but he basically just said, that's not what this verse is teaching, but you should still do it at church. But you can, you know, wear whatever outside of church. I mean, what a lame, watered down point. You just took the carpet right out from under you. This isn't, you know, I don't have any authority to say this, but here's just what I kind of think for church. So we look good at church. Who cares? It's not about what you look like. It's about doing what's right. And, you know, God cares what we look like, so that's why it matters. Okay? That's lame. And that's probably what you're going to hear probably anywhere else. Unless you come somewhere like this. You know, thank God for that. So, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 5, you know, the world's going crazy. The world's running with the freak show. The world's just trying to get his topsy turvy as it can, and they're pulling things in that direction. Well, God's people, they need to be pulling it in the opposite direction as much as possible, right? We are the light of the world, right? It says in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your, in verse 16, says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So God cares about what people see in us, right? Because man doesn't see the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, right? And God wants us to shine our light and for us to be able to have works. Well, you know, wearing something would be considered work because you're obeying that command, right? And if we're the light of the world, well, if the light of the world, if you got a bunch of Christians that are cross-dressing and the women are showing up at church, and, or just wherever they go. It doesn't matter if it's church. I mean, hopefully you got enough respect to come to church looking right. right. I mean, good grief, right? right? But, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, everywhere you should be consistent, right? right. If you're not going to dress a certain way at church, you shouldn't be dressing a certain way pro probably anywhere else. For most occasions, I mean, unless you're wearing like pajamas, you're working out or whatever. I'm not going to show up to church in workout clothes, but I'm not going to wear a dress on my own time, and I'm definitely not going to wear that at church. That's what I'm talking about here. So if we're the light of the world and we're failing to set the right differences and distinctions between gender and appearance, well, who is there going to be to bring it back get the right direction, yep. right? If the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness is what the Bible says. Now that verse is not talking about the church. It's talking about, you know, if, you're, if your eye is evil, it's talking about having an evil eye and, you know, because the light of the body is the, the eye. But, you know, I think you can apply this verse 
to the, how we are the light, you know, this, that which is supposed to be light, if it is darkness, whether it's the eye or the church or God's people, then if it's darkness, how great is that darkness? You know, because see, this world is like a tug of war. You got the world pulling this side of the rope, and you got God's people supposed to be going the opposite direction. And what's that, what's that standard? What's the standard that God makes? It's not the freak show standard and then like, you know, somewhere past God's standard, but at least it's not all the way. You know, that's, it's supposed to be God's standard, period. Where God draws a line is the line you're not supposed to cross. And that's the point of the sermon is to figure out where is that line. Well, I think for clothing, as far as clothing goes, for as far as man and woman, you need to wear clothing that's gender specific. All right? Okay, and you need to wear clothing that's actually covering your nakedness. How about that? That, that makes a lot of sense, right? Well, what is nakedness? Well, you know, luckily the Bible tells us what it is. You know, we just saw that verse in Exodus 28, verse 42. I'll read it again. Uh, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. So these britches are supposed to cover the nakedness of the priests. And they're going to, they're going to go from the loins to the thighs. Where, where do the thighs start? The thighs start right above the knee. If I do this, I'm grabbing my thigh right now. So that tells me that this is supposed to be covered. Because it's from the loins unto. So going past and reaching unto the thighs. This is not where the thigh stops right here. And this is definitely not where the thigh stops. That's barely the end of the loins. Right? And if you're sitting down and your pants or your dress goes whoop, well, you're, you're, not, you're not following the standard here of covering your nakedness. Right? And that's a shame. That's what nakedness is used interchangeably with. It's a shame. And we ought to have not a, not a whore's forehead. We ought to be able to blush. Right? <laughs> have some shame. And you know, the Bible talks about in Revelation how there are people out there that are naked and they don't even know it. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are naked and they don't know it. You know, you know, it used to be in this country where you go outside, you go out in public, and men were dressed like men, and women were dressed like women, and everyone's nakedness was covered. You know, but we're, we're getting de-Christianized in our country, and, we're, and those things are becoming just more and more just going down the toilet. You know? But we don't need to go down the toilet with the world. We need to keep the standard and work against the brainwashing and the influence and the teachings of the world out there. Cover your nakedness and have gender-specific clothing. Amen? Amen? How about that? Okay, the Bible says in Isaiah 41, uh, in Isaiah chapter 47, verse 1, this is more on just showing what nakedness is. I think this is a good help verse. Come down, Isaiah 47, verse 1, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstone and grind mill. Uncover thy locks. Bear the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. So this is basically talking about how Babylon is to be brought down low. And the women that are there, they're not going to be living it up like they have. They're not going to be in royals. So they're not going to be like in the throne room living the life of luxury, they're going to have to be grinding mill now. They're going to have to do some land, uh, you know, manual labor, you know, for women's work, basically, and grind the mill. And, you know, you're going to have to grind mill. And he says, you uncover thy locks. And then he says, make bare the leg, because he's going to make bare the leg and uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Because basically, if you're crossing a river that's got high waters as a lady, you're going to probably, you know, bring your skirt up, bring your dress up so you can walk and so maybe you don't get your garment wet. But as you're doing that and you're uncovering your thigh and you're going to cross the river, you're uncovering your what? Your nakedness. So if you got skin tight clothes right here, or if you got your dress or your skirt coming up or your shorts coming up or whatever, well, what are you uncovering? Your nakedness. Should we do that? Should we care? Well, I think God cares. You know, I, I don't think the world cares. The world definitely doesn't care. The world's got nudist colonies and just whatever. I mean, that's every beach is probably going to be a nudist colony in the future. Yep. Is that where we need to go? Are we, should we go that direction too? 
Because the standard for this in the past, 50 years ago, was different. 50 years before that, it was probably, it was even more strict. So the world's changing. But we should not change. Right? We're supposed to be the house that's built upon the rock. This is the rock. The Bible. The Bible teaches in Jude, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 21, it says, Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and if some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There is a garment out there that we're supposed to hate. What's that garment? Oh, it isn't. There is no garment. Well, the New Testament's talking about stuff that doesn't exist too, then I guess. You know, what's the garment? How about a dude dressed in drag? How about a woman dressed like a man? How about those garments that are spotted by the flesh? You know, this is something that I don't think that it's just the world that's guilty of. I think Christians are guilty of this. Because I see a lot of Christian women. I don't really see Christian men where, so, you know, it's kind of hard to pick on the men as much because, thank God, we don't have a lot of dudes going around dressed in dresses. Thank God. <laughs> but we do have a lot of women dressed like men. They're wearing that which pertains unto a man. We don't need to do that. You know, women, you know, make the choice yourself. Or husbands or fathers... Make the choice for them. How about that? You know, when I got married, I told my, well, I told my wife before we were married, hey, just so you know, if you marry me, you're marrying a crazy man because you're never going to wear pants again. You know, I'm throwing them out. You can throw them out yourself or whatever. She wore them before. She was a heathen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, and I think that's good if you can do that. That way you don't blow your wife out of the water if you can. But, you know, if you're not, well, you still doesn't change what's right and what's wrong. You still need to tell her. And daughters, well, you just do what's right. <laughs> and you're responsible, too, for, for those women in your house. And, uh, you know, well, 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 Jesus wore a dress, though. So what are you talking about? Jesus wore a dress. How, how do you know? Well, where's, the, where's the Bible say that? I, I, didn't, I never read that. Okay, well, well, but yeah, but I saw a painting of him, though, and he had a, like a toga dress thing. Okay, well... Was that what did Jesus really stand and pose for that? You think? No, I mean that that was a painting that was painted by a bunch of sodomites, That's right. a bunch of dudes that wanted to paint a bunch of naked dudes, and they're going to paint Jesus wearing women's clothing or wearing a, a, a toga, the Roman, you know, garment. Well, you don't understand history, Devin. You know, back then they all wore dresses. Back then, all the men wore tunics and and robes. Well, you know, it's funny about that. You know, I did a little reading uh, up on the history. Not, nothing Bible related. I just was looking up what, what was the attire for back then for the Roman Empire. Because, yeah, the Romans, most of the dudes, anyone that was a Roman citizen, the guys, the vast majority, they would wear like a tunic, okay, which is a dress, a skirt, basically, like a shirt dress combo. And the, the really rich, wealthy guys, they would wear robes. They just lounge. They don't have to do any work so they can afford to just to dress like a, you know, I don't know, just this super soft girly man I guess you know and so they're just chilling out and just whatever all day I don't know and and that's how they'll depict Jesus you really think Jesus wearing that when he's walking everywhere and doing all these things walking on the water he's gonna pick up you know like the, like the bride you know walking down the aisle he's like hang on I gotta get my maybe that's why he was late on the boat right he, everyone else took off oh man they took off I didn't have enough time to pick up all my, my excess robe or whatever you know, I guess the woman that washed his feet really had to get through it all, you know, to, walk, to get to the feet because all the robes there. Anyway, no, Jesus didn't wear a dress. You know, if you just look up the history of the Roman Empire, the Romans prided themselves on being so, like, you know, much better than everyone. And they're so enlightened because they were so culturalized and they, you know, the dudes wore their, wore their dresses. Unlike everyone else. They prided themselves on being different than everyone else because everywhere else, the men were wearing pants. The barbarians up north, they're wearing pants. And anyone that was a non-Roman citizen, a foreigner, which would be Jesus. Anyone that was homeless, which would be Jesus. They're not wearing, uh, you know, they're not wearing a dress. They're wearing pants. And they were looked down, <laughs> oh, look at this homeless Jewish man wearing pants. That was, that was how it was. It wouldn't make sense for him to be this homeless, non-Roman, uh, you know, non-Roman citizen going around with his toga, and he's not even a rich Roman. You know, so just, 
You don't even have to have the Bible, but you know what? The Bible teaches that it's an abomination if he'd have done that. And obviously we know that God was sinless. Jesus was sinless. So I just wanted to bring that up. That's an argument that I've heard. And, you know, anyway, I'm not even going to get into all that, but I think that's enough. So now we're actually going to get into 1 Corinthians 11. All right. So we talked about how Christians will be transgender in their clothing. Now we're going to talk about another way that God cares about our appearance, and that is our hair. Men should have, I'll just go ahead and tell you, short hair, and women should have long hair. You're welcome. I just changed your life right there. Solved all your problems. So this is what we should be doing. And we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11 here, and we're going to see what it says. And you be the judge. You see, you see what you think it means. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, we're going to start. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So right away we're seeing this hierarchy, this structure of authority being laid out, because the head here is being used, not to refer to in this verse as the literal head on your body, but the authority of, right? I mean, we use that usage today. So the head of every man, the boss of every man is Christ, Jesus Christ. And the head or the boss of the woman is the man. Not men, but the man, either her husband or her, or her father. That is her head, her authority. And the head of, oh, that's so degrading that, a, that you know, a man is over a woman. That's so horrible. Well, it says the head of Christ is God. Is that degrading to Jesus Christ to be under God the Father? No. It's not degrading. It's just how things are. I and mean, everyone has to answer to somebody, even men. Even if, besides just answering to Jesus Christ, I go to work and I'm not just doing my own thing. I have a boss. I have a head there. Oh, that's so degrading. He's so much better than me. Not, I mean, he's the boss. It's not that big a deal. Humble yourself is what you ought to do. Not, don't make such a big deal. Don't be a part of the feminazi you know, movement or whatever that just disdains this, this type of stuff in God's Word and hates this teaching. So he just laying out the authority here right away. And then he says, so he's going to equate our authority, our head in the sense of our authority, with our literal head, okay? Our actual head on our body. Every man praying or prophesying have his, having his head covered dishonoreth his head. And the head is not talking, you know, your, your head uncovered is not talking about having Jesus Christ uncovered as a man. It's talking about your literal noggin on your head. Okay, if you have your head covered as a man, you're dishonoring Jesus Christ as your head as a man. But, so contrary wise, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Well, who was that? That was the man her husband or her father. So man, in cover, well, men uncovered, women needs to be covered is what we're learning here, whatever that is. And the head of, and the head of the woman is the man, I already read this verse. <laughs> verse, okay, yeah, verse five is where I was. For that is even all as if she were shaven. So, so far, we don't know what the covering is. Like, what is it that it's talking about being covered as a man or being uncovered as a woman? You know, what is it talking about? Because, and a lot of people have different ideas about what the covering is. And I'm going to address as many arguments as I can for that. And, you know, you can be the judge. You can decide for yourself what you think it is. Because we need to figure it out. Because we don't want to shame our, or dishonor our head. So we need to know what it is. I, I would like to think that everyone here wants to know what it is, if you don't already. <clears throat> but he says, but if a woman is uncovered, that is even all as if she were shaven. Well, that kind of gives us a hint as of what he is talking about. Because shaven is a pretty specific word that's used to talk about cutting your hair. Okay, And that is what he's talking about. But we're going we're gonna to see what he's talking about. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Shorn is just another word for being shaved. Like, you know, so he's saying, hey, hey, look, if it's a shame to have a buzz-headed, ball-headed woman, then let her be covered. 
If, if you think that that's bad, then, then go ahead and let her be covered. Because if you're going to have short hair, well, she might as well be shaven. She might as well be bald. Okay. And then he says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Why is that? For as much as he is the image and glory of God. Who's the in the image of God? Man. See, this is, and this is another thing I want to point out. He is contrasting men being in the image of God contrary to a woman not being in the image of God because he needs to be covered or, or he needs to be uncovered because he is the image of God. The woman needs to be covered. Well, if she was in the image of God too, then that really wouldn't make a lot of sense. What is he talking about about being in the image of? Because, you know, I thought we were all in the image of God. Well, and not in every sense because in the sense of what does it mean to be in the image of? It means to look like something, right? If I made an image of myself, a picture or a statue, it's going to look like me. Well, men are in the image of God because we look like God, because we are male. We are men. We are masculine. God is a God. He's God the Father, God the Son. He's not a woman, right? right? And there's nothing wrong with being a woman. It's just that God is not a woman. That's why women should look different and men should look like the way God looks. And in that sense, women are not in the image of God. But in other senses, we are or we will be in the image of God. It really just depends on what, what you're talking about is, is all. And it's because in other places, it talks about how we all shall be in the image of Christ. And I'll, and I'll uh, see if I can find that in my notes right fast. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll just read these. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And so th we will bear the image of the heavenly. And this is basically talking about God and Jesus Christ. When He came back from the dead, He was changed. His body was changed into a, a glorified state. And He was sh literally shining, right? And that's how He exists in heaven. And that's how one day, when we are resurrected, that's how we will that's how, that's how we will be. That's how our bodies will look. It will shine just like His. So in that sense, we will share His image. Okay? And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, both with open, fa open face beholding as it is, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, the image of what? Into the image of the glory. From glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So in a sense, yeah, we will be in the image of God in the future when we're changed and our bodies will be like His bodies and we'll have that same glory. But in the sense that we're talking about 1 Corinthians 11, men are in the image of God and women are not. And I just wanted to you know, clear that up because some people will read the verses about you know, being in the image of God over here, but then someone will say, well, no, you're not. And you know, even back in you know, what we read earlier, 1 Corinthians, for, uh, Genesis chapter 1, Verse 27, where it said, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Semicolon, male and female created he them. So that last part, he said, yeah, he, he made both of them, but the man is in the image of God. So hopefully that makes sense. And 1 Corinthians 11 makes that distinction very clear. So moving on in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 here. But the woman is the glory of the man. So we're talking about the covering. Verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. This is just talking about, hey, God, you know, Adam was created first, and Eve was created for him. He was created to, she was created to be his helper. And that's all that's talking about. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. And I'm going to come back to this verse later. Because this is a very interesting verse for me, and I'm going to come back to it. Nevertheless... Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as much as the woman is of the man, or from the man, because you know, the, the woman is of the man because she was taken out of man, right? So she's from the man in that way. Even so is the man also by the woman. You know, you could look at that as we are literally by them and we need each other. Or you could look at it as every man is born by a woman. Right. So it's not like one is better than the other. We, we both need each other, you know. And then he goes on to say, but, but all things of God. Judging yourselves, 
Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? You know, you think about it to yourself. You know, you, you think about this. Is it, is it comely? Does it look good that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? So now we're starting to figure out exactly what the covering is. So now we saw the words about being shaved or shorn. Now we're saying, hey, look, if a man is having long hair, hair, right? That's what we're talking about, hair. Because if you have long hair, it's like a covering, right? If you have short hair, it's like your head is uncovered. And if a man has long hair, doesn't even nature teach you that that is a shame? So this isn't something that we should have to come to the Bible to figure out. This is something that nature teaches. This is something that we should just know instinctively. We should just get it. <laughs> you know, if, if, even, you, don't, you don't have to be saved. If you're just a man, unsaved man, looking at some dude with long hair, doesn't look right. And vice versa. But, you know, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Hey, that looks good. That looks great. She looks nice like that. For her hair is given her for a covering. What's the covering? I wonder what the covering is. I mean, what was he talking about earlier about the covering or being covered? Or, you know, what is that? Well, maybe it's hair. Because he said that her hair was given to her for a covering. Man. Oh, well, that's just a covering. Because he's really talking about a hat. He's really talking about a bonnet. Well, okay, because this is what I've heard. It, oh, that's not talking about hair. That's just talking about a hat or a bonnet, you know. Okay, well, where does it say hat in this chapter? I mean, we read the whole chapter. Did, did I miss that word? Where does it say bonnet? Maybe there's a different word in the chapter that means hat or bonnet. I, I don't think so. Right. And you can check it out on your own, right? Okay, well, let's pretend that it does mean hat. Let's pretend that it does mean bonnet. Let's go with that. Okay, so basically then this would mean that a man should never wear a hat or a bonnet. Let's just go with, let's just go with both or either or. We'll use this as we go. While he's praying or prophesying, while he's preaching or praying to God, he should not be covered. So he should not wear a hat or a bonnet. This is what people will say. Okay, well, did you know that God commanded the men to wear a bonnet and a hat? Literally calls it a bonnet, and then he calls the hat so it's a mitre, which is just a word for hat. You can look it up. And I'm going to read it to you. And they, so this is Exodus 39, verse 27. And they made coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron, that's a man, and for his sons, those are men, and a mitre of fine linen. That's a hat. A mitre is a hat. Look it up in the dictionary if you want. And goodly bonnets of fine linen and and linen breeches. There you go again. They're, they're wearing pants again? That's so weird. And a fine twine linen. Okay, so here they're wearing pants. They're wearing a bonnet and a hat, a mitre and a bonnet. And they're doing what? They're, they're ministering in the priest's office. Do you think they might be praying or prophesying when they're doing that? Amen. So if the, if the covering that nature itself is teaching us, so it's not like, oh, that was just back then. For the, well, it, it's nature. <laughs> nature is not dispensational. Okay, <laughs> or whatever. We're not dispensational either, but you know what I'm saying. You know, this is just something that's just right and wrong, and yet they were, they were told. It wasn't just okay. They were commanded to do it. And if they didn't wear it, what was going to happen? If they went into that tabernacle again, and they're, and they're praying or prophesying, and they're not wearing it, dead. <laughs> right? You know, okay, so could that be talking about a hat? Probably not. It's not mentioned. God commanded them to do it in the Old Testament. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think he's talking about hair because that's actually what's brought up. How about we use logic and not just assume things because we want to, right? But that's what people say, okay? Uh, well, Jesus had long hair, right? People say, well, Jesus had long hair because he was a Nazarite, right? Just like Samson. Aha, I gotcha. Okay, well, let's pretend that Jesus had long hair. How does that justify a woman to have short hair? Okay, well, he didn't have long, he didn't have long hair. But, but that still doesn't justify. Okay, well, and he wasn't a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. Okay, <laughs> so that's different than the vow of the Nazarite. And let's see, where, third page here. 
So, okay, if you if you if you go to you don't have to don't go there, but in Numbers chapter six, I believe, yeah, Numbers chapter six, he explains all the different qualifications and what is supposed to be done when you when they wanted to do the vow of the Nazarite. Okay, because that was something that, that they would do in the Old Testament that was symbolic and has been done away with. But what they would do is for a time, anyone could do this, and what they would do is they would basically vow this vow of the Nazarite, and then that during that time they would not cut their hair, and they would also not drink anything of the of the vine, no juice, especially no alcohol, but it's juice is what's actually permitted normally. And they're not supposed to come near any dead body of any kind during the whole duration of the vow of the Nazarite. And then if, that, if any of that is violated, then the vow is over. Okay? And then when the vow is over, they cut their hair. And this is like a temporary thing. And Samson, he was supposed to be a Nazarite his whole life. So he was an exception within the exception. Because normally it's a shame for a man to allow his locks to grow long. But in the vow of the Nazarite, it was permitted for a time because it was representing something. And Samson was the exception within that where he was supposed to do it his whole life. And see, it wasn't some cool thing. It wasn't, like, oh man, Samson's so cool. He's so strong. He's like, you know, he's like, uh, you know, Conan or whatever. Like he's a strong guy with long hair. He's this barbarian. That's so cool. I want to be like him. No, it was actually a shame because Samson pictured Jesus. You know, and hopefully you know that, you know, there's a lot of things about Samson that picture Jesus. And one of the things that pictured Jesus is that he had the long hair, which is a shame. And how does that picture Jesus? Because he had long hair too. No, because he endured the shame of the cross. You know, it says, it says in Isaiah 50, verse 6, and this is a prophecy about Jesus. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame. And spitting. It says, looking unto Jesus in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. So Jesus endured shame, and that shame was pictured through Samson. And okay, and let's let's pretend that Jesus was a Nazarite, which he wasn't, because the Bible never says that he was a Nazarene, but he was coming near dead bodies all the time. Right. He was drinking juice all the time. So is, is he sinning now? I mean, you know, so that's, that's an easy argument. Oh, well, I saw a painting, though, with him. Okay, we're going back to that again. The same flamer who painted him with a dress, painted him with long hair. Okay, problem solved. Don't look at pictures painted by flamers, right? Okay. Let's see here. I think that's pretty much all the arguments about that. Uh... Okay, so I want to go back to, you know, hopefully this, this is pretty simple. Okay, hopefully we've learned so far, men, short hair, women, long hair. What are we talking about exactly? I'm talking about the man bun. Yeah. I'm talking about the dreads yeah. that men will have. Okay, for the women, how about all the older women that have perms? What is it that in this country, you know, women get older and they chop off all the hair and then they just curl it and now it's okay to have short hair? Amen. I mean, what is that? I think it's a rebellion toward, uh, of their heads, what I think. You know, uh, I'm talking about, you know, the haircut where it's, you know, long in the front and then short in the back. And then they want to go talk to the manager, right? <laughs> now, I want to see your manager, you know, that, that type of woman or whatever. And I'm not saying all women are like that they have the haircut, but I'm talking about that hair, haircut. Because there, there's, there's, there's that which is short hair and there's that which is long hair. Okay, and there's a middle ground that no one should be in. All right, you, it, we shouldn't just have a shag like we're just kind of like, I mean, I, is that long or is it short? I don't know. It's just kind of like confused. I mean, the women that have the haircut, they look, look confused. Like, I don't know if I want to have it. Do I want to have it long? Do I want to have it short? I mean, I don't know. It's confusion. They need a man to tell them grow it out. Right. That's what they need. And it would to God we'd had some men that would speak up and leave their houses. How about read this chapter and figure out that nature is even trying to tell you, grow it out. <laughs> and, you know, men, cut it off. I don't care what football player. Oh, man, that football player is so cool. You know, he's got his long hair running around. Look in his tights. That's real cool. I don't want to be like that. Cut it off. That's a shame. It's not cool. 
Don't be brainwashed. How about you be transformed by the re renewing of your mind, right? Okay, now I'm going to see if I have a little bit of time here. Uh, I'm taking up a lot of time. Y'all still good to be here, right? I'm going to try to explain the, the, this is the best part of the, of the chapter right here. Uh, because I want to explain what I, what I believe this verse means in, uh, verse, in verse 10. For this calls out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, we're seeing in this chapter an authority structure being laid out. Okay? The man answers to Christ. Christ answers to God. The woman answers to the man. It's a chain of authority. Okay? And this chain of authority is set in place for our benefit. You know, whenever Adam and Eve sin in the Garden of Eden, he said, okay, well, since you sinned, Eve, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be ruled over by your husband, and thy desire shall be to him. This paraphrase. Adam, this is what you're going to do. Every day you're going to work by the sweat of your face. This is going to keep you out of trouble. If you're working, Adam, you're not going to be able to get into sin. And if he's keeping up with you, Eve, then you're going to be kept out of trouble. That is the function, because that's, that's going to help prevent what happened in the Garden of Eden from happening all over again. Okay? The, God's commandments are not grievous. Th this authority structure is for our own good. Okay? You know, so, and, and I'm going so to get back to verse 5, but, uh, verse, verse 10 in 1 Corinthians 11, but I want to explain this concept a little bit. If you turn to, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Talking about in the church. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? I mean, God is just down on women. I mean, wh why, why can't women speak? I mean, what's wrong with them? Does God just hate women? No, it's for their own good. Why? Because he says, for Adam was first formed and then Eve. What does that have to do with it? And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So... Women have a greater tendency to be deceived than men, is what the Bible's teaching. So, hey, Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was. Eve thought that it was a good idea to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam knew it was wrong. He did it anyways. That's why God said, hey, you need to tell her no next time. Right. You know, if, if she's tricked, you know, and, she, and, and she's tricked, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just genuinely, well, she still needs to be told no for her own good. And you know, we ought to love our wives enough to tell her no if she's doing something that's not, that's not right. Amen. Right? Um, and so, you know, and there's other things that men, men are better at than women, and there's some things that women are better at than men. You know, so it's not like, well, which one's better? I want to know. That way I can be like one or the other. No, it's just, if you're a man, be a man. If you're a woman, be a woman. Don't try to fight God and what you are just embrace it. Embrace what you are. You know? And, uh, so, but nonetheless, this is something that is going to help keep her out of trouble. Him looking out for her is how I see it. You know, the world, oh, that's degrading. Actually, he's looking out for her. That's what it's supposed to be. Because next time she wants to eat of that tree, Adam should be like, no. You know, go back in the kitchen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Or whatever, right? You know, you know, tell your wife no is what you ought to be able to do sometimes for her own good. Because you love her. Because you want you would do anything for her. As Christ loved us. Right? And he tells us no a lot too, right? Okay. So, and in this, this teaching is also taught in 1 first, first Timothy chapter 5 later on. And he's teaching here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'll just explain it and then I'm going to read it. But he says, basically, he wants women to be married and to have children and to guide the house so that they can be kept out of trouble, okay, for their own good. Okay, let's see that. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. He's talking about, hey, don't just take care of any widow that needs help from the church. The church needs to only take care of certain widows. The younger widows, you need to refuse. They need to get remarried, okay? If they're younger than 60, they need to get remarried. And you can read the chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 12. These, these younger widows that are not married, it says, having damnation because they have cast off their, their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So these women, they're not married, they don't have anything to do, so they just kind of do whatever. 
They just kind of go around. They're on Facebook just seeing what's going on, seeing what they can spread, seeing what the drama is. We haven't, oh, I'm not going to get into what my neighbor's like. <laughs> well, yeah, well, my neighbor, you know, she's not going to listen to this. She's not saved anyways. But uh, uh, she goes around, she's literally, she has a golf cart, and she literally goes around her neighborhood from house to house. It's just gossiping and, all, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But this is what God wants to prevent, okay? God wants to keep this from happening, so what's He going to do to prevent it? He says, I will therefore. So this is what I want for that reason, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Who's the adversary? Well, our adversary is the devil. Our adversary, the devil, you know, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Because see, the devil, he's going to look at us, men and women, and try to get us to do something wrong and then accuse us to God the Father like he did in the book of Job. Right? He's going to try to get your wife to eat that tree and he's oh, she ate that tree. Right? And that's how the devil works. So, but if you're kept busy, you're going to be unlikely to get into that. So why do I say all that? Well, I think this is what is being referred to, this situation... Because in this chapter, he's talking about the head. Why the woman has the man as the head. All right? And so he says, for, verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I think this is referring to, the power here referring to the authority, not her literal head again. I, the woman needs to have that long hair on her head as a sign of her submission to her authority. Right? So that, or because of the angels, so that devils, or the devil, will see that and it'll, it'll act like a deterrent from being deceived. It's like, well, that woman, she, she's got her husband looking out for her. The long hair I can see on this woman tells me she submitted unto her husband. She submitted unto her father. She submitted unto her head. She's going to be a lot harder to get to trick. Because if I trick her, her husband, her father is going to be like, no, right there. That's what that, that's what that literally means. Even if it's not the case, it's going to create the tendency to the, for that anyways. Okay? But if you saw this other woman, she's got the long hair, and she's just telling her husband what to do. That, that, those things go hand in hand, by the way, if you've noticed. Then he, oh, okay, well, I could probably trick her a lot. Because who's going to tell her no? When I trick her, who's looking out for her? That's, that's what I think the verse is talking about, you know. Basically having that outward sign of, of showing that you're submitted so that you would be less of a target for a devil. So, well, it says angels, not devils. Well, the Bible uses the word angels to just refer to devils. And he even used a verse this morning. Uh, I'm going to read one. Uh, if I could find it here. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, the, the angels that sinned. Who's that talking about? The devils. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude, uh, Jude verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Angels can just be referring to devils sometimes. Fallen or good, you know. So I think that it makes more sense for it to be fallen angels. But, you know, if you disagree, that's okay. Um, but that's, that's a tie-in. And see, the reason why this is important, why does it matter about the authority? What does it have to do with the appearance? Well, the, the appearance affects the heart. Okay, the priority should be cleanse the inside of the cup and the platter and that the outside may be clean also. Well, what does the inside have to do with the outside? Well, these things are related, okay? And if you, theoretically, you would want to clean the inside first and then that would affect the outside. But you know what? The outside in of itself will affect the inside. You know, if, if, you know, talking about the way that we should be dressed, you know, if I wore, you know, a police uniform, I'm not a police officer, okay? But I'm probably going to feel a little bit like one when I'm wearing that uniform. Don't you think? I mean, if, if, I'm, wearing, if I'm a man, I'm wearing a dress, I'm probably not going to feel so manly. I'm probably going to feel a little bit weird, right? You know, and vice versa. You know, if you're a woman wearing pants, it's going to make you feel more masculine. It's going to cause you to think that way, feel that way, and you're going to get into that mode of thinking. And you apply it to whatever. You know, if I'm, if I'm going out and I'm wearing sweatpants and whatever, 
you know, a wife beater, you know, I'm going to feel kind of like a hubba. You know, I'm going to feel like a, a bum, like kind of late, not, not really be all that productive. You know, if I'm wearing work clothes, if I'm wearing a suit, hey, I'm going to be taking myself more seriously. And not only will it cause the way I think about myself, it's going to affect the way others view me and perceive me and interact with me. This, and this is why it's important for a man to look and dress and, 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 uh, and have hair for a man and, and, and the vice versa for a woman. Because it, it'll make your marriage better. Because, see, think about within marriage. If you have a problem submitting unto your husband as a wife and you have short hair, grow your hair out. That'll actually literally, that will work to helping you be more submitted to your husband. And if you're, you know, God forbid, if you're a man, you have long hair and, you, you know, you're having a hard time manning up in your marriage and, you know, being a good leader and being someone that you can be taken seriously. Well, how about you cut your hair off? It'll actually help you work harder, too. When your hair is getting all in the way, it, see, it's not practical for a man to wear a dress or have long hair. Because men are supposed to be the ones that are the main primary providers, right? Well, you can't really do all that good a job working hard when you're wearing all this girly stuff, right? Which is another reason why Jesus couldn't have been doing any of that. But anyways, so we need to not be a part of this transgender garbage, okay? You know... You say, well, I don't, I don't like this subject. You know, I, I don't agree with this. You know, I, I don't think that you're quite right. Well, you know, the Bible says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, sometimes things don't seem right. The world's going to listen to this and like, man, that definitely doesn't seem right. This guy is crazy or this guy is whatever. Well, it, does, it might not seem right, but did, does, that, does that mean that it's not right? So you, we need to look at this stuff, look at it up yourself. Hopefully you wrote down the verses if you needed them. And you can prove this stuff yourself and make the decision to adopt it yourself. You know, um, so in conclusion, you know, let's, let's be men if we're men. It's a real basic sermon. Let's look like men if we're men. Let's have a man's haircut. Let's actually not bring dishonor to Christ, right, as a man. And as a woman, let's look like a woman. Let's dress like a woman. Let's have long hair like a woman. And let's keep it going even when you get older, too. You don't just, oh, I'm 65, so I'm cutting it off, and I'm curling it up, and I'm putting on the whatever. No, 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 no. Let's be what we're supposed to be. Let's be either male or female. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that this sermon was a help and uh, that people would receive it. You know, and, uh, and just make the changes if necessary, Lord. And uh, hopefully we would not just think that we need to just go to people and bombard this over their head or, you know, just drill it into people, but that we could just have it for ourselves and teach those that would receive it. And uh, Jesus, name I pray, amen. amen. Actually, one last thing I wanted to say, because, see, people will turn. You thought it was over. People will go to the last verse here and, uh, of this subject in 1 Corinthians, and they'll say, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such customs, neither the churches of God. They'll, and they'll use that verse and say, Well, then, if anyone wants to argue about it, then, then, well, you know, then we don't have to do this. This is not what we do. But see, he's not saying that this is not what we do. This is not what we believe. He's saying this is not a church custom. Because, again, this is something that should be in instincts. This is something that nature itself teaches us. We shouldn't have to go to religion to figure this out. And if someone wants to be contentious and argue about it, don't argue with them. You know, just you do what you want and you let them do what they want. And, you know, that, that should be that. So I just wanted to cover that real fast. You know, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to read that and think that that somehow discredits the whole sermon right there. All right? <laughs> That's it. You want to come?